Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to round two coverage of the Women's World, the 2015 Women's World Chess Championship taking place in Sochi, Russia. Before I get to the game that I selected from round two, I wanted to uh, revisit this one position from round one because I wasn't uh, entirely happy with my explanation that I gave at the time. So I thought I would take another shot at it and see if I could uh, make it a bit clearer. So in this position, black has just played the move knight takes e5 grabbing this uh, central pawn and restoring the material balance. There was a trade of pawns, and, and black is just grabbing the pawn back. And now uh, white, in this position, sees a, a tactical opportunity and plays the move g4. And the idea with g4, right from the start, and I should have mentioned this, is just to trap this bishop. This bishop really has uh, no squares to go to, or very few. A limited number of squares to go to. Um, if it goes to e4, then uh, the move f3 kicks the bishop again, and it still has nowhere to go except to the square g6, which is where it was played immediately. So either way, um, it would have transposed. And now the move f4 comes, followed by f5. So f4, f5. f4 comes with tempo hitting the knight, and then f5 just traps the bishop, because even after the pawns are traded, the bishop is still under attack, and this square the h5 square is covered by the queen and the bishop battery, so the queen, so this bishop on g6 is just going to be trapped. And you might think it's game over, but both sides have uh, seen further than this. So f4, kicking the knight, and now the knight goes to the square uh, c4, hitting this loose bishop. Uh, but just for example, if the knight really had retreated somewhere else, then you push on with the pawn, and this knight, uh, this bishop on g6 is a goner takes, takes, and you see it's still under attack, and it can't go to this um, h5 square because it's under control of white's pieces. So, so black is just losing a piece in that line. The only, the only playable option for, uh, as compared to knight c4 is that black could potentially try the move uh, d4, but uh, that's a complicated line. I'm not going into it, and it still uh, works out into white's advantage. So actually, the move knight c4 is the best move in the circumstance, and it saves the bishop. It saves this bishop by gaining a tempo. And this tempo is very important. It's attacking the bishop. If the bishop retreats, then black has time to move a pawn forward or, uh, or play, play another pawn move. Maybe, maybe with the f-pawn would be more appropriate. And this bishop will then be free. Uh, it'll have a, scare, a square to escape to, and it won't be under threat of being trapped anymore. So... Uh, so white needs to act uh, very vigorously, and, and white plays the best move here, too. Uh, just trading off the knight, and, um, and then now pushing on with the f-pawn, um, and hoping to trap the bishop. But now uh, black can trade queens, and this is forced. It's the only way to save the bishop. Black takes off the queen. Cancel that. Um, takes the pawn first. That's right, you can take the pawn first. Then you take off the queen. Rook takes d1. And now the h5 square is no longer guarded. There's no piece there that, that guards that h5 square. So the bishop can go to h5. And so uh, uh, black maintains uh, the material balance. But uh, as you saw in the rest of the game, this, this position actually favors uh, white. And white went on to win the game a very nice victory. So hopefully uh, that explanation uh, cleared up that that key moment in the game. Okay, so let's take a look at our game from uh, round two. I wanted to take a look at the game between Natalia Poganina. She's a, a Russian player with the white pieces uh, facing off against uh, Winjin, Winjin Zhu from China. So uh, Natalia kicks off with d4. Now, I selected this game for actually two reasons. First of all, it's a really um, interesting game, a very positional game, as opposed to the uh, round one game I selected, which was very tactical. This one is almost completely positional. Um, and secondly, um, it's in a um, line called the Meroxy Bind that I've been trying to learn myself. So I have selfish reasons for wanting to go over this game and try and understand it. And uh, uh, Chess Explained, if you listen to his channel at all, he talks a lot about these Meroxy bind positions, and uh, he plays them a lot, and he thinks they're pretty good for white. So I, I wanted to learn more about how to play those, because I have a few uh, players in the club who play the Accelerated Dragon, and I, I 
uh, and the and the uh, principled way to play against the accelerated dragon is to play the Meroxy bind. So I just want to learn how to play these structures. So I want to spend some time. Anyway, I'll put a link uh, in this uh, in the description of this video to uh, the video from Chess Explained, where he plays a a rapid game uh, in this uh, style in the Meroxy bind, and uh, he gives a pretty interesting explanation of it. Um, but let's uh, go on with this game. It starts out d4, knight f6, so it doesn't uh, look like a Meroxy bind at all. In fact, it looks like a uh, King's Indian defense, which it is. And uh, we get the normal moves, knight c3, preparing to bring the pawn to e4, bishop g7. Black is just setting up this neat little structure on the uh, king side, preparing to castle there. e4, d6, and uh, now h3. So the the, um, the classical line in the king's Indian defense goes knight to f3 followed by bishop to um, e2 and uh, black's moves are castles and uh, e5 so that would be the classical king's Indian so this is the Makaganov line in the king's Indian also a line that uh, chess explained likes to play um, black castles and uh, Natalia plays bishop e3 here there's, there's different choices of how uh, white can proceed at this point. Um, knight f3 is still a move. Bishop to g5 can be played, putting some pressure on the knight. But uh, really, the, the bishop wants to um, come back to e3 in any case. A lot of times it goes to g5 with the idea of provoking the move uh, h6, and then it drops back to e3. But it's a, a good post here looking at the uh, central d-pawn. And... Uh, and now black has a choice of how to proceed here. He can, uh, she can proceed with either e5 or c5. In this case, uh, Wenzhen Ju played the move uh, c5 here. And after knight f3, uh, she took the pawn on d4. So this is, after this exchange, this is now the Meroxy bind. We have these two classic uh, pawns on uh, e4 and c4. And we have the missing C pawn. That's uh, why this often happens in Sicilians, because uh, the pawn is already on C5 in a Sicilian, and it trades itself off for the, the D pawn, creating this, uh, this structure. <coughs> and um, so what are the ideas in the Meroxy bind? Well, um, let, let's put one more move on. Um, Win Jin Ju plays knight C6, <coughs> developing a piece and also taking a look at the knight here on D4. Now, one of the ideas in the uh, Meroxy bind is that uh, white has a little more space due to these uh, pawns in the center. And so white is motivated to keep all the pieces on and try and prove that, uh, that black's position is a bit cramped and uh, she's going to have difficulty finding homes for all her pieces. Uh, but if you look at the structure, there actually is a place for every piece. The bishop can go there, the rook can come here, this rook can slide back and forth, the queen can come out this way. So the idea that you can run black out of space is is not entirely uh, it's not entirely so simple, but um, but it can be played that way, and that's uh, generally the style in which Chess Explained tries to play it. So he plays moves like knight to c2, which is not actually the most common move here, um, but uh, what it does is it keeps material on. Instead, uh, Natalia is playing in a slightly different way, so I thought this was kind of interesting. She plays the move bishop to e2, which is uh, the main choice in this position, and allows the exchange. So knight takes and bishop takes. And black does want those exchanges. Uh, this will open up some lines for the bishop. If uh, the bishop goes to uh, d7 and the knight stays on c6, you know, it doesn't, doesn't have a lot of scope there. But uh, now it's got, got some extra squares it can run to. So um, bishop to d7 was played. And castles. So both sides of completed their setup. Now, uh, um, Wen Zhengju places her bishop on c6, and uh, Natalia responds with uh, queen to d3. So, knight to d7, uh, provoking another exchange here. Uh, the bishops are now facing each other. Um, but white is not unhappy with this exchange, because this uh, uh, dark-squared bishop is a key defender of the king side, and a very good piece in this particular structure. This isn't a typical King's Indian with a blocked center with a pawn on d5, I mean e5. That pawn is still back here on e7, so the center is open, and this bishop potentially has a lot of scope. So um, so both sides gain something by this uh, 
by this exchange. Um, white gets rid of a very strong uh, piece, one of black's very strong pieces, and black gains a little bit more space. So just trades in general are good for black. But white continues with the strategy of developing or gaining space. So playing the move pawn to b4. And so really, if you count the, count the rows, uh, black can occupy three rows and uh, white can occupy four rows. And there's kind of this no man's land in the middle where uh, white is controlling a lot of the squares with all the pawns on the fourth row. So we'll see if uh, this can be turned. I mean, it, it looks like a kind of theoretical advantage, but how can this actually be turned into a win? And uh, both sides play this game really well. It's hard to find a, uh, a mistake in this game, any single move that's uh, an actual actual mistake. There's just a kind of a general trend here. So after b6, uh, queen d4 check is played, and the king drops back to g8. And now a3, shoring up the pawns on the queen side. Rook to c8, that's very logical development for the rook, putting it on the half-open file and uh, gazing at white c-pawn, which uh, may become weak. This c-pawn is a bit restrained by the pawn on uh, b6 and the pawn on d6. They're holding it back, so it might become a target. Um, bishop to g4 was played. So activating the bishop, not r allowing it to be relegated to that defensive role of just defending the uh, pawn, but getting it out and uh, pinning the knight. The knight, um, uh, one point of this move, b4 here, is it controls the c5 square, which is often a great square for the knight. The knight can't hop to that uh, c5 square anymore, but it still might have ideas of coming to the e5 square, and that might also be a good square for the knight. So this uh, bishop move temporarily puts a stop to that. The queen goes to e8, maybe uh, preparing to push some of these pawns. I'm not quite sure what the point of that is. And now f4, um, taking away <clears throat> taking away this square from the knight. But uh, this gives black a chance to strike back with the move f5. You might think uh, this is a bit of a, a weakening move and perhaps a risk for black, but actually this was a, a top engine choice. Um, I mean, maybe black just needs to find some way to break out, feeling feeling the pressure of all white's pieces uh, accumulating here on the fourth rank. Uh, maybe uh, uh, the black player is starting to get a bit nervous, but in fact, uh, actually, uh, according to the engine, f5 is the best move here. So um, it is going to try and free up uh, the game a little bit, um, and we'll see how the tactics work out. So there's an exchange, so now there's a open diagonal for the dark squared bishop, I mean, the light squared bishop on c6. G takes f5, pushing um, this bishop back. The bishop drops back to f3, opposing light squared bishop. And now this is uh, encouraging another exchange. So the queen goes to f7 first. This bishop is protected, and the, um, black is just continuing to develop her pieces. Um, the rook, the a rook goes to e1. Cancel that. The a rook goes to e1. Putting the rook on an open file. I guess this uh, rook is still usefully defending the bishop. That way the rook can take back the bishop and the pawns don't get damaged if there's an exchange here. Um, the knight goes to f6 now. It's got a square now that the f5 move has been played. And it wasn't, uh, it was out of the way so that the, the move f5 could be, uh, so the f5 move was possible and now, now it comes back. And now uh, a white chooses to exchange off the bishops. So uh, it's a different strategy. It's uh, um, exchanging pieces where she thinks it's appropriate and still uh, trying to maintain the space advantage uh, all the way through the game and uh, into the end game. We'll see where um, it can become an advantage. Okay, so knight to d5 was played. It looks like um, white has finally played this characteristic move. Knight to d5 is something that's almost always played in Meroxy bind setups. Often there's a pawn still on d5, so that uh, d4 rather, so that uh, either the c pawn or the d pawn can take back, and uh, white will get a nice uh, advanced pawn structure here. Uh, in this case, the the knight d5 move was delayed until uh, all the other pieces were traded off. Now the only piece that can take off this knight is the other knight, and we'll get into a position with just heavy pieces. Um, first of all, just to mention, I mean, e6 is an alternative, but it's not a very attractive one. It's a way to kick the knight out, and um, well, the knight can exchange itself on, uh, on f6, 
Um, the chess engine is giving an interesting line with b5, kicking the rook first, rook to c5, then knight takes f6, queen takes, and queen takes d6. So grabbing a pawn there. So it looks like uh, it's just, yeah, that e6 move is too weakening. And it uh, looks like immediately that, that pawn on e6 is a goner if uh, white plays it right. But just in general, you, it's, it's uh, the kind of move you don't want to play. And uh, it's not clear if you can afford to live with this knight here for very long. It's a very powerful piece. It generally has to be exchanged off. And so uh, Wen Zhenju trades it off immediately. And now uh, white takes back with the pawn. That's, that's the idea is you want to uh, have these advanced pawns here. It's not only gaining a tempo on the rook, but it's also restraining the adjacent pawn. And this may become a target. So the rook drops back to c7. And now rook to f3 is played. This is a flexible move. The rook can go in either direction. It can go to the g-file to harass the king, or it can go to the uh, e-file to put more pressure on the e-pawn. Queen to g7 was played, keeping, keeping the rook out of g3 for the moment. And uh, queen to d3. So we get a little bit of maneuvering. Cancel that, d3. Get a little bit of maneuvering with the pieces. Um, maybe the, the queen is trying to find a way into the camp on the light squares. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not clear how this is going to proceed. And now this move, king h8, this one was questioned a little bit by the chess engine. But I think it's uh, difficult in this plan for, in this position, for, uh, for black to come up with a plan. The chess engine is recommending rook to f6 here. Kind of a funny move. You don't often want to lift your rook off the back rank. Um, but it does um, maybe control this uh, e6 square. Maybe that's a, a plan. And maybe it has ideas also of coming to the g file and putting some counter pressure on the g7 pawn. So that might have been uh, maybe one, one slight mistake here by the black player, but uh, pretty subtle one. Anyway, queen to king to h8 was played. And now the rook goes to g3, supported by the queen. Ah, okay. I, I, let's back up and take a look at this queen d3 move again. That was the point of queen d3, when the queen moved to d3 here. It's not just that it was looking at those directions. It was supporting the, the rook coming across to g3. So king h8 is getting off of the g file. Rook to g3. And, uh, and so that's why rook f6 would have been an idea. Rook f6 to here would have supported... Uh, would have been a, an answer to rook g3. Okay, but uh, king h8 was played, and now the queen, um, after rook g3, the queen goes to b2. And this was the idea, keeping the queen on an active uh, diagonal and, and uh, counterattacking in this fashion. If the rook had been on f6, uh, this move wouldn't have been possible. The queen would have been uh, stuck on this side of the board. So Wen Jinju decided to go for activity with the queen, and so that was the motivation for that uh, king h8 move. So um, white's king, uh, Natalia's king, goes up to h2, just getting out of the way. And now rook to f6 is played in this position, maybe also with ideas of coming to the uh, g file. Um, the rook is played to e2, tracing the queen away, the queen goes to a1, staying on this diagonal, and uh, maybe putting some pressure on the pawns over here. Rook to c2 is played, opposing opposing the rook and uh, provoking another trade. So the pair, one pair of rooks comes off. And now this um, move rook to g6 is played. Black plays rook to g6, opposing the other rook. So Natalia at this point decides to uh, give a check with queen c8. So... Uh, the queen is invading, and it's looking a bit uh, risky. The rook can't drop back to defend because the combination of queen and rook is uh, checkmate. <laughs> so uh, king to g7 has to be played. And now it um, looks like white could just pick up a pawn with the queen takes here. Let's see, that was not played. In fact, the stronger move, rook e3, was played. But let's, let, me, let me understand why this is not working. Queen takes, and then... Rook takes. Uh, the chess engine says this leads to a draw after this exchange. Queen takes a three check. Hmm. Okay. So uh, the uh, white picks up a pawn, but it uh, loses a pawn over on this side of the board, and uh, 
looks like wherever the king moves, white is going to pick up another pawn, and uh, it turns into a position which is completely even. Zero, zero, zero is the engine evaluation. So, uh, so white is not tempted to grab that pawn after king g7. Uh, Natalia plays the uh, correct move, which is rook to e3. So that uh, keeps the rook defending the a-pawn, and at the same time uh, targets the backwards e-pawn, which uh, could be taken with check. So what is, uh, what is uh, Wen Zhenju's response here? I guess e5 is forced. There, there doesn't seem to be any way to defend it. King f7 is met by queen d7, so just piling up on the pawn, and uh, that's not looking very good. So e5, top engine choice too, so this is just a very difficult position. d takes e6 was played. Cancel that. d takes e6, oh, taking en passant. In this position, uh, Wen Zhenju plays queen to f1, bringing the queen back over to the king side. Um, and so Natalia throws in the move queen b7 check, getting the queen on this diagonal. The king goes to uh, h6, and then she brings her queen back to uh, f3, so trying to uh, chase the queen away. Uh, so there's nothing better here than uh, trading queens. In fact, any other move leads to big trouble. So the queen trade occurs. G takes a three, and we get into a rook and pawn endgame where white has this uh, passed pawn here. But, uh, well, black has a passed pawn too, but it's much further back. This, this pawn on uh, e6 is, is really dangerous. So rook to g8, and rook drops back, and now rook to d3, switching. So this was a really cool technique, I thought. Um, the uh, pawn for the moment is not under attack. This rook was forced back because it needs to get in front of the pawn to prevent it from queening. And so just at this very moment, um, not only is this pawn non not under <laughs> not only is, is this pawn not under attack at the moment, but it can't easily be attacked. So there's time for the rook to s s switch attention to the e pawn. And um, no matter what's played here, um, uh, white is going to be able to grab the e pawn and defend the. Uh, grab the d-pawn and defend the e-pawn. Now you see the e-pawn goes eventually, but uh, well, it's a sequence and white gets something else in exchange. So this, there's this constant uh, trading of one advantage for another. So I thought that was a real nice uh, trick. There's just this one key moment when it's safe to uh, switch the attention of the rook from uh, defense to offense, just defending this pawn to attacking uh, this pawn. So the king comes over to defend, king to g6, and now the rook grabs the d-pawn. And the king goes to f6, trying to surround the uh, this uh, e pawn and round it up. But now uh, um, black or uh, white white Natalia can push on with uh, b5 here, uh, gaining some more space. So h5 is played, and uh, rook to d7. So at this moment, abandoning the um, e pawn in favor of grabbing some pawns on the queen side. And these out pa outside pass pawns may, may prove to be decisive. So king takes, and rook takes a7, and now h4. So it doesn't look entirely uh, clear. Um, black has these two pawns that are holding back three pawns. and um, But white has a one pawn advantage over on this side of the board. It's not entirely clear if this is going to be enough to win the game, at least not to me. The, the chess engine is pretty confident at this point, but... Uh, Anyway, yeah. well, white is still uh, staying active. Natalia plays her rook to b7, going after this pawn, which also cannot be defended. But uh, uh, Wen Zhenju can get active with her rook now, with rook g3, and start scooping up some of the pawns on the, uh, on the king side here. So it's going to turn into a kind of race, and uh, whose pawns are going to uh, hit the goal line soonest is going to determine the outcome of the game. So rook takes b6. But, uh, you know, it illustrates uh, the important principle that uh, having an active rook in the endgame is, is really key. So this, this uh, rook wasn't happy, even though it was in, you know, a, a position behind a pass pawn where you're supposed to put your rooks. Uh, it was much happier when it got active and started scooping up uh, black's pawns. Okay, rook takes b6. The king goes to d5. It needs to keep an eye on these pawns on the queen side, try and get them from, prevent them from getting too far. a4 is played, and now scooping up the f pawn, the king actually is centrally located, so it can play a role in helping uh, the black pawn's queen as well as in stopping 
the uh, the white pawns from queening. So it's an ideal square, but at some point, um, its loyalty is going to have to be uh, uh, demonstrated. It has to. It's going to have to choose one side or the other. A5 is played, and these pawns just keep marching forward. Rook to a3 now, going over to try and uh, slow down these pawns, but it gets all the way to a6. Now king e4. So at this point, uh, black chooses to go for a counterplay, trying to scoop up this f-pawn and getting a passed f-pawn on her own behalf for her own side. So king g2, getting prepared to uh, stop any uh, uh, pawn from uh, advancing to the final square. And uh, that's one key difference, is that this king is not in a position to stop these pawns, whereas uh, white's king, even though it seemed out of play for much of this period, it's ideally placed for this phase of the game, where it's, uh, its job is to stop uh, black's two pawns from uh, scoring. So king takes f4 is played, creating a passed pawn. Now rook to b7, um, just getting out of the way of the pawn so they can advance one step further. Rook to a2, check was played, the king drops back to f1. King comes into f3, threatening checkmate, a uh, very common technique in these endgames, forces the king out from its ideal defensive position and uh, over to the side, king to e1. Now f4 was played, advancing one step closer to the goal, but uh, a7, and now the, the move um, rook a1 check, chasing the king away from, uh, from this uh, pawn, and uh, king to g2. So this king is out of the way, and the pawn has a straight uh, shot down to the, uh, uh, the touchdown square here. But, uh, but it looks like white's pawns are just a little bit closer. b6 is played. Now the move f3. And then uh, rook g7 check is played. So the king takes this pawn. And now king to e3 is played. And at this point, uh, black resigns. So white has gotten that ideal position where the king is stopping these pawns from advancing. The king and the rook are stopping these pawns from advancing. And these pawns can queen by themselves. This is a very important point. You have two pawns that are on the sixth rank. Um, they are stronger than a rook. They By themselves, they can defeat a rook unless the rook is in a position to take one of them immediately. And here... Uh, uh, white has already gotten in one extra move, so no matter where black's uh, rook is, it can't stop these pawns from queening, whereas, um, whereas white can uh, put his, her rook behind these pawns and stop them from queening. So um, just for example, if, uh, if black were to try and harass the king for a little bit, she could throw on this check. The king can just step in front of the pawn. If there's another check, then... Uh, then the white king will just grab the pawn, so that's hopeless. Um, but what else is there? There's no more checks. Um, just a king move, and then this pawn is queening. Doesn't matter if uh, the rook takes this pawn because the other pawn will queen. Even even giving up the rook is still going to be okay because the the queen will defeat the rook. Actually, it queens with uh, check. <laughs> that's that's embarrassing. If uh, if rook takes this this is queening with check. So. Uh, that's uh, entirely convincing. So let's back up in this position after King e3. Uh, Win Junju resigned. So Natalia won her match because of this victory against Win Junju, and that was uh, the biggest upset of the tournament. Uh, Natalia Poganina from Russia with a rating of 2456 defeated uh, Win Junju, who was the second seed in the tournament from China with a rating of 2557. So let's uh, go ahead and do a recap of um, the whole round. We're down to uh, 16 players, so I guess I'll, I'll go through and uh, just tell you who all the winners are. And um, the top seed, Humpy Canero, she won from China. Natalia Poganina, the game we just saw from Russia, she won. Anna Muzicek from the Ukraine. Victoria Kmilite from uh, Lithuania. Alexandra Kostinyuk from Russia. Valentina Gunina from Russia. Uh, Zui Zhao from China. Maria Muzicek from the Ukraine, uh, who's Anna Muzicek's sister. They're both uh, in the final 16 here. Antoinette Stefanova from Bulgaria. Uh, Bela Kotinashvili from Georgia. Pia Kramling from Sweden. Um, Dronavili Harika from India. Uh, Dronavili 
Drona Valley, rather. Drona Valley in Harika actually defeated Irina Kresh. So that was the last uh, U.S. player in the tournament. Uh, got uh, defeated in round two, although she did make it to the tie breaks, but uh, lost on tie breaks. So Drona Valle Harika from India is in. Uh, Mary Arabidza from Georgia also won her game. She was matched up against uh, Yanyat Marrero Lopez, whose game we looked at last week. So uh, Yanyat was uh, defeated in round two. Mary Arabidzi goes through. We have uh, Leila Java Kish- <laughs> Let's see, Java Java Kishvili from Georgia, uh, Marie Sibag from France, and Alisa Galyamova from Russia. So those are the 16 players that are still in the tournament. Stay tuned, and I'll be bringing you round three coverage. See you then. Bye.